How do you know? Experiment. A message. Let's see who it's from. Hi, it's me. Call me back. Oh, it's Charlie. Let me just find out what he wants. What's up? The game? Two o'clock? See ya. I can't believe you knew that message was from Charlie. I recognized his voice. From only six words. I know his voice. I bet you had other clues. Other clues? Yeah, like, he's the only person you expected to call today. No. He always calls this time of day. No. You called him a little while ago, and you told him to call you back. No. Charlie's lived next door to me my whole life. He's in my class. I see him every day. I'd recognize Charlie's voice anywhere. You're sure? Positive. I could pick his voice from a hundred other voices. Okay, maybe you're right. But let's prove it. Let's do a controlled experiment. That's when you eliminate all the things that could change the result of the experiment, except for the one thing you're testing for. So... We're going to see if I can pick out Charlie's voice from a lot of other voices without even knowing that it's Charlie? Exactly. Scientists do controlled experiments all the time as a way to test their theories. For instance, is this man just whistling a tune? Or could this whistling be a language? Joseph Carret lives in France, in the Pyrenees Mountains. Shepherds there used to communicate across long distances by whistling. They said their whistling was a language, but some people didn't believe it. To find out, scientists set up an experiment, a controlled experiment. That's Joseph and a neighbor, 30 years ago. Here's the first part of the experiment. Joseph's neighbor whistled single syllables into a microphone. In another room, Joseph heard the whistles over a speaker and tried to identify them. He got most of them right. This is a controlled experiment. By separating Joseph and his neighbor, the scientists made sure the only information Joseph was getting was his neighbor's whistle. In a second experiment, they whistled whole sentences. Just by listening to each other over the speaker, they were able to carry on a conversation. Voice grams were taken. Here's the way the word Federico looks when it's spoken. Fe-de-rico. Here's how it looks when it's whistled. And here's how it sounds. By the end of the experiment, scientists had shown that the shepherd's whistling was a language. Okay. Ready to see whether you can recognize Charlie's voice without any other clues? I'm ready to prove it. I've taped Charlie saying, hi, it's me, with my camera. I've also taped two other guys the same age as Charlie saying, hi, it's me, Jermaine and Max. Okay. I'll play three voices, and one will be Charlie's. It might be the first voice, the second, or the third. Let's see if you know which voice is Charlie's. This will be easy. We'll do 12 tests to make sure you don't get lucky or unlucky. It's not luck, it's pure skill. I'm going to make you sit over here so you can't see the tape. 
No problem. Okay, test number one. Here's voice number one. Hi, it's me. Voice number two. Hi, it's me. And voice number three. Hi, it's me. Um, I'd say voice number one. No, 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 no. Voice number two. No. Voice number three. Yeah, no. Voice number one. Number one, right? I can't tell you whether you're right until we do all the tests. I must be right then. Let's try another test. This time, they might be in the same order, or they may not. Ready. Here's voice number one. Hi, it's me. Voice number two. Hi, it's me. And voice number three. Hi, it's me. Voice number three, definitely. Here's another experiment. But instead of people, this parrot is the subject of Dr. Irene Pepperberg's research. His name is Alex. Dr. Pepperberg has trained Alex to speak a human language, English. Deborah's visiting them. How many different words can he say? Okay, he has a vocabulary of 30 labels for objects. Mm -hmm. He knows six colors, five shapes. He can identify quantities up to six. And he has functional use of phrases like come here and no, and I want this or want to go there, where this and there are actually appropriate labels. So like when he was requesting, I want walnut, he can put any of those 30 different objects in the slot where walnut was. Does he know what it is? Dr. Pepperberg asks Alex questions. Alex answers in English. Good boy. That's right. That's right. For a parrot, chewing apart a piece of wood is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And he gets the wood as his reward so that there's the closest possible association between the object and its label. What do you mean the label? Okay, he identified the object. He, he gave a name to the object we were handing him. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call labeling. So oh. he used the human term to identify the object. I'll be back two hours, right? Pretty cool. But does Alex understand what he's saying? To find out, Dr. Pepperberg is doing a controlled experiment. Can you tell me what's different? Want to taste? Tell me what's different. Okay. Can you tell me what's different? So you're asking him what's different between the two That's objects. That's correct. Tell me what's different. Color. Good pair. Color. That's right. There is a difference between these objects, and the only difference between them, you see they're the same material, right. and they're the same shape. Mm -hmm. The only difference is their color. Hey, what's different? Come on, what's Alex, different? what's different? What's different? Shape. Good birdie. Shape. You're a good parrot. This is a controlled experiment. Both objects are orange. Both are made of wood. The only difference is their shape. And Alex said so. Dr. Pepperberg has done this experiment many times, and most of the time Alex gives the right answer. That shows that Alex understands the question and the answer. So he understands the concept of same and different. Right, and this means that we can now in the laboratory get actual data on what's happening. Because he can communicate with you in some That's way. That's correct. That's correct, yeah. And this isn't the only thing Dr. Pepperberg and Alex are working on. How many? How many? Two. That's two. right. You're right. That's right. You're right. There were two. Yeah, you want a nut. Well, now you can get one. Get a small nut. So yeah. you, this time he said two. And does he say two the majority of times? Yeah. He's right, again, about 75, 80% of the time. We don't know, actually, though, if this is counting. All right, there's a real difference between identifying quantities uh -huh. and counting. And in order to get the, see if he understands counting, we've started another project using what we call sequential. Uh -huh. All right, and we've been doing that with a metronome. And we're still trying to train him on this. So I'm going to see if he'll do this. So counting is something that's in a sequence. That's correct. Okay, now will you listen? Listen. How many? 
If you don't tell me, I'm gonna ask Deborah. What's this, Alex? Look. Chipinary? What's Spinary? This is an apple. Okay, that's Alex's label for the object. Okay, he made that one up by himself. This time we were training him to say apple. And he had begun to say a little puh noise. And then all of a sudden he looks at it and he says, I want binary. And at the time, the labels in his vocabulary for fruits were banana, cherry, and grape. Binary is a combination between banana and cherry. Right, and at the time, the apple was red, so it made a lot more sense than for the green one. Like a big cherry. That's right, which tasted a little bit like a banana. Wow. Do parrots talk to each other in the wild? We think they do. We're not sure. A lot of researchers are doing some experiments to determine whether that's true or not. The parrot in particular has what's called a duetting behavior, which means that a parrot and its mate, when separated by great distances in the wild, mm -hmm. have a specific code that they use back and forth to locate one another in a big flock of birds. And they've also been shown to use a different code when they're very close together, say sitting next to one another on a perch. And scientists suppose that this is some kind of communication code. Hey, where do you want to go? You want to go on shoulder? Let's go on shoulder. Oh, you want to go on her shoulder? Okay, you can go sit on her shoulder. There you go. Hi, Alex. I gotta go eat lunch. Here's voice number one. Hi, it's me. Voice number two. Hi, it's me. And voice number three. Hi, it's me. It's kind of hard to hear them without seeing them. I'll say voice number one. Sorry, Z. Charlie's voice was number three. And the final score? You picked Charlie's voice three times out of 12. Not so great. Well, just by guessing, even without hearing the voices, you probably could get it right four times. So... So I guess I was wrong. I'm not able to identify a voice without some other clue. But there's more to it than that. How did I know it was Charlie? Hi, it's me. Hi, it's me. Hi, it's me. When you want to test a theory, you can do a controlled experiment. That's when you eliminate anything that can influence the results of your experiment, except for the factors you're testing. A controlled experiment helps you support your theory. Three to One Classroom Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.